Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, uh, quick bit about me, since that seems to be the preview. I'm um, the program lead for MSc in uh, cybersecurity at the University of West of Scotland in Glasgow in England. Um, Glasgow, Glasgow in Scotland. God, I get shot. I don't know. That's me. That's me fired already. Um, so um, I've been a network security engineer doing connectivity and various different things back from the days of X25 through up to cellular stuff. Um, and I'm also a PhD candidate doing a um, passive acoustic monitoring um, um, review of cryptic species using their bird calls with the final um, end game of actually um, being able to do host identification, i.e. Being able to tell you which bird is which, not as in species, but individuals within that species range. And I'm using LoRa as my uh, as my connectivity uh, uh, choice. So, some basic housekeeping. LoRa stands for long range. Okay, it doesn't stand for loud radio or anything. Depending what you see being bounced around, it stands for long range. It's pronounced LoRa or LoRa. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, it's definitely not Laura. Um, OK, it's uh, Laura, Laura or whatever. And unfortunately, because of the nature of this biz, there will be quite a lot of these three letter acronyms, or, which is my favourite, but techies love abbreviations. Now, before we go into Laura and wherever, one of the important things is what has driven this ability for us to be able to consider to use this. There has been a massive explosion in the interconnectivity of uh, connecting small sensors for monitoring traffic and environmental factors and all sorts of things. You know, the interconnectivity of bizarre things like microwaves and fridges and stuff that has allowed us to have a landscape where we can actually begin to start to leverage the technology for us to be able to ga gather data that actually matters to us, things that's actually things that really count, things that will allow us to uh, sort of um, gather data to design solutions that will either help bring something back from, um, you know, near distinction or help um, a specific, m make us learn out more about um, specific, specific um, species of interest for us. The problem is, is, um, there are limitless potential solutions for us to use, OK, but there's always this trade off uh, between um, the data rate and the range. Um, you know, we have um, various technologies that exist for us, at low data rates and short range. And we have, you know, we have cellular, you know, and, um, you know, the power that that brings to us for certain solutions. But the problem is, is obviously these things are are resource hungry, not necessarily just being able to make sure that they turn on, but also make sure that they connect. The cellular stuff is great uh, for us for be able to be able to get uh, a decent band, uh, a decent data rate bandwidth. Um, but it's only where there's coverage. And as you'll see in another slide, slide, you know, coverage for lots of solutions is limited at the moment and more importantly for us when we're looking at cellular communication as the d as the g number increases the cell size decreases which means yes we're getting better throughput yes we're getting better bandwidth but unfortunately we're needing more and more cells in order for us to be able to provide a decent level of coverage for any technology they want to use then of course we've got our uh, low power wide area network protocols such as lorar and NBIOT and Sigfox, um, and they are, you know, they are really useful to us because they have that's very similar key features. You know, they've got about five kilometers range in urban environments, 15 kilometers in suburban environments. You know, with some of the devices, depending on what you're sending, you can get, you know, some really uh, uh, amazing long battery lives of 15 years for some devices. They can be deployed and low cost, but some of these module models, sorry, um, actually have a cost as well, which for us as um, as uh, ecologists or whatever, whatever we're trying to study is it's actually then eating into the very limited funds that we may have available to us in order to, for us to deploy a possible solution. 
So, um, and the problem we also have is that there is this imbalance. You know, we may have a large data packet that is what is being produced, but we may not actually have a, a suitable medium to do it. So it's a very unequal uh, playing field for us. You know, we might be in this in a situation where we have large amounts of data, but only a small carrier in order for us to do it. And that will seriously limit limit what we can actually achieve and perform. Part on parcel of one of the major problems that we we have faced as researchers is the availability of data. So back in 1985, when I looked like this, computers looked like this, and data traveled around on these. They were very limited storage. We didn't need much to be going around with. But now, unfortunately, in 2021, Computers look like this. They're tiny. They're nowhere near, you know, they're portable, that we can do anything we want to do with them. And umpteen thousand times more data exists in really small packages so that we can do, do things. But believe it or not, by in 1985, the first IoT devices had already gone live. In fact, they'd been live for three years already. Coca-Cola was already using IoT to actually monitor some of their machines in remote parts of the country so that they could actually get an idea when they were full. So IoT, this idea of the Internet of Things has been spreading for a long time, long before uh, somebody came up with a really good, a good name for it, but it was actually existing and being used for viable purposes back then. When we are deciding on our um, methodology, we need to understand what our perceived area of um, of connectivity is going to be. Now, th this is a screen full of three acronyms, but it is really important for us to understand the scope of what we are trying to cover, especially when we are trying to choose a, uh, a, a solution to fit um, our research question. Um, so we may actually may be thinking of a methodology that could potentially use two or more at the same time because the problem we have is is that with almost all of these technologies the perceived signal strength or the signal to noise ratio within our signal decreases as the distance from our receiver increases which gives us you know a problem you know if we are getting beyond the the sort of range of wi-fi and various other things like that we then are asking other questions of our solution to provide us with a, a realistic idea of what we can actually achieve when it comes to um, collecting of data, gathering of data, and actually being able to, to, to utilize that in a useful manner. This then gives rise to the second problem set that we have when we are looking at using uh, connectivity. That, you know, looking at this graph, cellular is an out and out winner. You know, it's, um, it's actually, um, stands out as head and shoulders above what what we can expect and you know it's a graph that's been used in lots and lots of different research um go as, as an argument for using other technologies and hence why low RAR has gained because actually quite a lot of our powers have limited power available okay and they where there is limited coverage so we need to come up with a different usage a different usage model sorry in order for us to come up with um, the stats or the metrics that we're going to do. So we can't just expect ourselves to be able to just have all the data that we get. So, you know, we have this um, idea of what we want to collect, what we're going to utilize in order to gather our information, whether it's just in this instance, basics telemetry data or, um, you know, geographical information, we need to think quite carefully about what we are going to do, what we're going to um, actually uh, utilize in order to gather the metrics that are important to us. And one of the things that we need to think about when we're doing this is what are those metrics? And these are, this is something that we need to be thinking about because unfortunately, although LoRAR is a valid solution, it isn't a silver bullet. It can, it's not a fix all. OK, 
So we've decided on LoRa. So what is LoRa? Well, basically it is a, a wireless technology that was developed by a company called uh, Ciclio in France, which was a buy, a, uh, acquired by a company called Semtech. It's a family of RF chips that operate in a license free environment. So basically you don't have, if you are using low RAN nodes, you do not have to have a, um, a, a license in order to do this, which believe me, if I'd have known that when I started my journey, it would have saved me having to go through the trouble of getting an amateur radio license, but I didn't waste it. My radio license is actually M6 IOT because I was gonna use this for IOT. So I actually registered the IOT license. So, you know, the nerdiness continues. So what we're looking at is a long range transmission for a very low power consumption. So we're looking at a chip that is going to allow us to um, be able to get as much bang for buck from our uh, device as possible. So how does LoRa work? Well, for those of you that are already needing a bit of a lie down, shall we say, let's just stick with magic, okay? It's just, it's, it's just magic, we just do that. But for those of you that are still with me, um, within networking, we have these seven model, seven layers within an ISO model, which is what we are talking of, what, which was what we look at for all of the um, stages that a packet of data will go through going from the application or the, the program that's running in order to get onto the, the wet string between the two cups that we're using as our transfer medium. And LoRaR is actually a, a packet of processes and um, technologies that actually work across all the models, but actually the, the bit that we are really looking at, the modulation actually exists between the physical layer, actually converting it to wireless, you know, invisible packets that are going across the internet um, and to between endpoints, depending on how we're actually doing it. And it's governed by various regions, although I said it was license free, it's actually governed by particular law and ordinances of companies. So depending on which country you're actually trying to deploy in, you need to be cognizant of the actual uh, license range that you're doing. And it won't be the first time that a um, system's been designed in one country to be deployed in another and actually using the wrong frequency range. So for instance, in the in the U Europe, it's the 8068 uh, megahertz range. Okay. And within this infrastructure, we have the, with the, uh, with the, um, Within the lower R infrastructure, we have this idea of the modulation, getting the signals backwards and forwards, but also the uh, media access control and how the packets are routed are all looked after by the um, lower R architecture. And that consistent, depending on wherever you go, you, you, there are lots of different models that you can use this, whether it be a private network or using something like the Things network. Um, it will always follow this topology, consistently follows this topology of having a LoRa transceiver, which uses the LoRa to connect to gateways, whether that be a private gateway of your own or whether you're using a public, um, using a, uh, a publicly available one. These will then, these gateways will then use various um, um, methodologies in order to route traffic to, uh, to the, just trying to keep the jargon down to the right uh, receiving application, depending on keys that are inbuilt within the system. OK, and getting the, the, the packets from your low RAR node to your application, routing using keys that are embedded within the system in order for you to be able to route it through. So typically the devices that are, uh, are used within the low RAR architecture are small, uh, microcontrollers um, with uh, varying um, processor speeds. They support multiple process, uh, multiple sensors using lots and lots of different buses like SPI or I squared C, having ADC support, sorting pit serial. Well, actually, some of them have inbuilt GPSs. Uh, they can use lots and lots of different technology. They are built with power management in mind. Lots of these systems 
use processors which will support something called ultra low power mode, which will mean that it can actually use various different CPU states in order to reduce its activity. So it's actually um, will following a, a simply put a calendar system will actually decide when it's on, when it's operating and at different times be doing different tasks in order to reduce it. But what we can do is by managing this and actually looking at what we're running at particular times, we can actually get um, the the CPU in, in certain models to be as low as sort of 10 micro amperes for when it's in hibernation mode, which means that as long as we are uh, optimizing the time that it is in optimization, uh, you know, it's, it's in this optimized low power state, we can increase the, the lifetime of the device out in the field. And by reducing the amount of time that it uh, allows us to do it, we can, for instance, use single cell batteries in order to power these for a long time. And if we make sure that we're only using very low data rates, that um, they, can, they can last multiple years. The technical bit about low RA. So how does how do we how are we optimizing this? How are we making sure that this um, this solution is fit for purpose? How are we making sure that it allows us to get the necessary throughput and that this it's robust enough in order for us to be able to deploy this? Well, basically, it uses something called spread spectrum transmission. So rather than using um, peak uh, transmitted power it keeps it it tries to keep its transmission power as low as possible in order to make sure that um it is saving the battery power as possible because if you think about it if you shout really really loudly your voice gets tired quickly whereas if you speak at a normal you can carry on talking um so we use this we try and keep the transmission power spread across the spectrum that's available to us as much as possible for avoiding high peaks and therefore actually having so, some longevity of our power usage. In order to make sure that we can consistently have a, um, a very good data rate, we use this idea, they, they, they used this idea of a chirp spread spectrum and they use up chirps and down chirps depending on what they're sending. And basically uh, this is a sinusoidal wave that actually increases or decreases depending on whether it's an up chirp or a down chirp. And they use this to, um, to uh, this, this, um, this wave to embed the data on, so it's actually split up. Uh, so the ones and zeros come through with a bit more clarity, and we can actually use another technology, which is called a spreading factor, which allows the system to dynamically work out what is the optimum uh, transmission data rate, shall we put it, um, using some maths to come up with a, an optimum transmission rate for the packets that you're sending. So they can, between the gateway and the node, uh, we can actually come up with a, um, a self assigned by the dynamically by the system, a spreading factor and a chirp rate, which will actually allow it to us to increase the bit rate when it's within quite a lot of range. But um, when it's actually getting a uh, longer range, we actually reduce the, uh, we increase the spreading factor, increasing the number of chirps per symbol, because we are trying to make sure that they get through. So the more chirps we put, the more, they, the sort of, the, the more robust we're trying to make our signal, thus increasing the range. But the payoff with that is, is that we are also um, decreasing the bit rate. So as, the range goes up, the bit rate goes down. So unfortunately, it's not uniform. So if you are looking at a, 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 a longer range, you are looking at trying to send less and less uh, data the further you are, which might be uh, uh, is something I'm going to come on to later, but, but that might be something that you consider during the design of your project. There is, however, a bit of a buzzkill, I'm afraid. Several of the public networks actually have a fair use policy, which means that there is a limit in the amount of uptime that you can have from a node in a 24 hour period. 
and the things network for instance is 20 uh, is 30 seconds in a 24 hour period so you know okay these are milliseconds but that means that you quite quickly can run out of your lot if you're trying to send lots and lots of packets your broadcast time for a, a spreading factor of 12 for instance is you know um 1400 milliseconds that soon you know if you're sending lots of packets that can soon add up which is why we are limited when we are sending our our data across these links to just normally serialized data containing bit values of of interest to us you know not not um not, not images or large audio files um, unfortunately but however if you're using a um a private network these limits don't apply. So if it's possible for you to utilize your own gateway, uh, which we'll talk about in a slide or two, then, you know, that's 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 probably best practice for you. But you may be in a situation where you are using um, an area where there are um, different gateways. OK, so what does the gateway look like? Well, for test purposes, you can get single channel gateways. They've been sort of phased out. They're not supported by quite a lot of the um, the solutions that you can get for your back end. They come with indoor and outdoor support. So, for instance, those people, excuse me, two seconds. Those people that are using LoRa for internal um, monitoring of things, you know, there are internal gateways. There are also outdoor gateways that um, I've got an example here. This is a IP65 LoRa gateway that um, our, its brother is stuck on my roof. Um, so this works as a, as a receipt gateway and a forwarder for me. Um, you can also get um, open source solutions. So you can get one that you can make yourself. Um, that's the IANAS um, one. You can get the plans on there and show it how to make it yourself. Um, it's made out of drain pipe or you can buy um, a more um, industrial solution um, if you're wanting to run your own private gateway and you're looking to um, to run lots of nodes. So um, what's the coverage like? Well, um, I um, I use the Things Network for a lot of mine and, and there is quite a lot of coverage now. Yeah, OK there are huge black spots on here well you know with all things that coming no, no, no lora is not a, a mainstream protocol that we're looking at at the moment and so you know there will be but you know for where i'm based you know for the for coverage there there is quite a lot of coverage for um the ttn gateway in central scotland when you see when you get outside that there are other gateways that are not on this list and depending on how those people have set their their gateways up, they might actually forward. So you might find. So, for instance, on this map here, there are two. Where's my mouse gone? There are two huge wind farms, one here and one here. Um, they have low RAR gateways and there are, you know, we can piggyback uh, stuff over their gateways. So some private gate, some private get, uh, low RAR gateways will actually forward traffic on for you um, uh, because obviously a LoRa antenna will pick up any LoRa packets it comes. The gateway actually has to decide what to do with that traffic. Um, it can be configured to just forward it onto the internet to its own server and then move around. However, um, what it can do, um, but that's only if it's been configured to do that. OK, so. Um, so one of the benefits about LoRa is that it is actually encrypted end to end. The keys that are used within the configuration of the nodes themselves, the sensor nodes, the keys, the application keys, the network keys that are actually used by the system actually allow you to have a layer of encryption over it. So if you are wanting to use a public network and you are using it, the 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 node and your end server are the only thing that will actually know what the traffic is um, when you're there are two particular models for connecting one is called over the air activation and that is the preferred version because basically you just give it an application an application eui so that allows it to be routed 
to the back end by any gateway or if it's your private gateway routed through to your application server and these are then these um, keys are then generated by the back back of house system the alternative is what's called ABP or activation by personalization and unfortunately that means that every key pair has to be in embedded into every node that you are using so you actually have to do this manually for every one that you're doing which means basically if you are trying to run a thousand nodes it means that you've got to put that into every one of these so um, you need to be careful um, with how you configure it okay so looking at your um, configuration for your system is is doing it. so we've covered soup to nuts how the devices are config what well in a higher higher overview you know the device types you know what we could potentially do with them you know we've got multiple sensors we can attach we've got temperature we've got humidity we've got light anything that you can attach to an arduino and um and I, as i sort of said in the show notes before this you know if this is your first foray into microcontrollers the um jacinta and akiba have been running a really good course um on um building your own biologger, which will give you a really good idea into what you can expect to be able to connect to these. But once you can get that data into your microcontroller, the system that you are using um, is allowing you to just basically serialize um, your data and just transmit it as a, as, a, as, as a list of ones and zeros. And that brings me really onto the next slide. The lower architecture is obviously is obviously being driven by application or real world applications as as the people out in industry would like us to believe you know they the the, the things that's being used for, for security for uh, agriculture waste management lowras being um, tested you, uh, for looking after old people you know monitoring using accelerometers and if they fall over and all that sort of stuff um, being able to monitor them not moving and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, lots of these things are being driven and, you know, cities up, cityscapes are buying into this and the technology is being driven faster and faster forward in order to cope with their needs, which is a really good buy-in for us because basically we are getting lots of new uh, innovative um, things being pushed forward for the industry is the next big thing, which we're being able to, being able to utilize ourselves in order for us to be able to gather 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 um some leverage from this so practically you know the the robustness of um these devices have developed over the years you know as long as gone as the the sort of you know rs components plastic box with things bolted into you know these things are now being mass produced and you know being used for cattle monitoring or irrigation and all of a sudden these are available to us and now you know even the big players in in lots of the sort of uh, retail markets are getting on board with this and this is a um this is um a low ra tracker for your pet you know which uh amazon are trying to use for um amazon are trying to use so that you can uh with their amazon sidewalk i don't know if you've heard of amazon sidewalk where they're gonna make it so that all of the um, all of your your ring cameras and your uh amazon echoes and stuff will have a publicly available side so that you can use that for transmission of low rod data transmission and reception of low RAR data, which is quite cool. But enough of that. We've been, you know, we we know, we know that this is where it's going. But obviously, this means that we are now in a position where low RAR is actually a feasible model for us to be able to use uh, for environmental monitoring. We can gather data, water heights, temperature, all of that which might be interesting for an environment wind direction heat all of that stuff which normally take man hours actually means that we can now realistically have a chance to uh, do things like population dynamics actually looking at a population looking at migration trails seeing where they're going to have a problem with uh, infrastructure or people 
things like locational aware awareness. Um, a really cool example of this is um, in uh, Holland. They have um, I'm going to get this wrong. The, the West End uh, Nature Reserve. I'm just going to bring this over onto my screen. They're using LoRa to track a herd of bison uh, live so that visitors to the park can actually go and see them and actually work out where they are so that they are um, they can also see when they are where they're going any areas that they're looking at and that's you know really useful for them to be able to uh, make it as an attraction for people to use that which gives them you know a reason to push it forward which means that yet again somebody else has done some more research into making more robust collars which can then be upscaled and used potentially in an environment where the livestock may be causing an issue for instance you know actually being able to use LoRa to monitor a herd of elephant when they're straight potentially straying into crops or near a settlement actually broadcasting it out so uh, particular um, um, monitoring systems are put in place where when they always broadcasting the geolocational data and actually coming up with securities like putting on lights or klaxons or anything that which will actually get people to um, uh, react to the elephants and scare the elephants away so that they don't come into conflict with the people. Also they've been used uh, for individual monitoring so actually um, used for specific cases of actually tracking individuals over long periods of time, looking at dive depth, you know, um, breeding patterns, all these sorts of things that's actually looking at things that are solitary, which could be, you know, very useful for you. Also, um, they have been used quite a lot in longitudinal um, uh, cases. So actually looking at environmental stuff where we are looking at the long term effects of things. So uh, thing where where time is not of an essence, if we are not looking for real time data, uh, which we would ordinarily be looking for low right. And let's face it, you know, part of the reason for us putting connectivity on our solution is because we are wanting uh, a dynamic aspect to our research project so that we are getting uh, ready hands on to our uh, data that we are researching. <clears throat> but potentially we have a situation where we might be looking long term where we could actually have the necessary bandwidth to look at things like populations of um, penguins here in a remote solution uh, in a remote, remote um, location and the throughput is not of an issue so we can actually wait the day and a half that it would take in order to transmit an image uh, over low RAR but you know it's it's still doable for us. So really a, a lot of you are asking the question of you know what will low RAR, will low RAR help me and you know one of the understandings is 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 where does LoRa fit into your landscape? You know, what are you trying to do um, with your solution? What are you trying to to gain? What the questions I think you should be asking with the LoRa is what is it you're studying? What is the effect? Um, what effect will real time data have on your um, on your research? You know, what will that data do for me? What exactly is it I am trying? What are the metrics I need? I was speaking to somebody the other day um, about my research and I was spent quite a lot of time trying to work out how I could um, uh, notify myself that I'd actually successfully received um, a, a call uh, from one of the bird species that I was monitoring and I was spending ages trying to come up with a a convoluted way of transmitting and receiving over low RA and making sure I was getting it until somebody pointed out that surely all I needed to transmit was a one. I didn't need to put any long message, just a one. Have you heard one? No, I don't send anything. Have you heard one? Yes, I'll send a one. There you go. Job done. Job sorted. So sometimes you might be needing to think about what it is you are actually looking to transmit 
what it is you're actually trying to send. Because at the moment, we are limited with the infrastructure. You know, we're looking at um, a, a range problem. You know, we're looking at within uh, forests or whatever, uh, you know, very limited range. Uh, you know, the metric I gave you at the beginning um, of five kilometers within a built up environment. Well, that's the same whether if it's dense rainforest, you know, we're going to be pulling in lots of interference from big trees as we would from tall buildings. So, you know, that's something that we maybe need to think about, but we can be used as long as we understand what metrics we're trying to send, that we can use them for, you know, monitoring weather, looking at the interconnection of devices, GPS tracking. One of the cool things that you can do with LoRAR is, is you can actually use it to set up a wireless center network. So one of the things that's been limited at, um, up until recently is that with lots of other nodes and lots of other technologies, we could use other node, they could use other nodes to act as access points uh, along the chain in order to get. So if the transmission distance is only five kilometers, but the but the base station is 12 kilometers away, but there are a couple of nodes between between me and the desk, the um, the base station, I could actually transfer my data from node to node and actually use it as a as a route through um, uh, in order to get to my endpoint. Um, and those who've actually uh, had a look at various different ways of deploying this, there is a thing called ZebraNet, which uses um, um, this technology for um, connecting, actually use setting up a wireless sensor network between individual animals, individual hosts, and then bouncing the network between themselves to other base stations using something that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So at the moment, we are sort of restricted by the infrastructure. Where is the nearest internet connection that we can actually get in to, uh, to do this? Um, but luckily for us, um, there is a solution around the corner, especially when for those of us that are potentially looking at re more remote sites, and that is that LoRa just went satellite. Um, it is uh, the first iteration of this is FOSSASAT-1, and it was an open source cube satellite. Um, this is um, a methodology that was um, developed uh, from a couple of challenges by various space agencies to come up with tools and um, tools and experiments that could be run within a particular square. And a 16-year-old student came up with a LoRa satellite that provided coverage. Um, and like I say, it was open source. So you might see all this high-tech stuff and think, oh, what is that amazing antenna that they've got there? Um, it's actually a tape measure, because um, like I said, it's open source. So, um, you know, it was built from constituent parts and then obviously a proper prototype was made. Um, and it was launched into space, um, but basically into a low Earth orbit and did receive and retransmit several signals uh, during the test message, which actually led people to actually think to ourselves, right, OK, this is obviously viable. So um, we now have um, a, the first commercial offering, um, a company called Lacuna, which uses a store and forward technology. And I am just about to show you what that looks like. So, hopefully you can see this. Somebody could give me a thumbs up or a yes. Cool, thanks David. So this is basically uh, a piece of software that predicts the location of satellites. And I am looking for Lacuna Sat-1 at this moment in time. It's currently uh, goes around in progressive geosynchronous, or uh, not geosynchronous, progressive uh, geo orbits and basically is traversing round in a in a pattern around the Earth that basically means it covers every area of the Earth three times every 24 hours. And so basically this is where I am currently stationed and this is the coverage bubble for Lacuna Sat. And basically when that comes onto the horizon, when it comes within our horizon, we will be able to receive. So basically our base node, rather than trying to collect to our local node, we actually just stick the antenna skyward and we basically point it to transmit up into space and it will receive the signal 
and um, then basically it will receive the signal, then it will wait until it's over another um, another ground, st uh, sorry, over a ground station, and then we'll transmit them using the helical antenna down to the ground station. So if you're not needing necessary real time um, transmission, this could be a this could be a possible solution. They are testing it. This is the third iteration of the satellite. Um, and I think once these tests are completed, they will be looking at la launching more um, with the um, European Space Agency soon. So hopefully, you know, we'll be looking at a situation where LoRa won't actually limit, we'll, we won't be limited by the the distances. And I think the current the <laughs> the current land-based record for LoRa was something like 742 kilometres. It's now 70,000 kilometres because it's once it's been up and back down again, um, you know, the it the, does the, the, the different. So um, that's that. So um, that's my last slide. So um, we can pop over to questions if everybody's OK. Yes, thank you so much, Sean, for that great lecture. Um, that was that was terrific. So one of the reasons I was interested in uh, moderating this episode is because I'm sure everybody who has attended any tech tutors where Laura has come up um, knows that this is a very complicated topic for a lot of us. It's hard to even understand what it is. It's it's something that feels very um, very hard to get a grasp on in terms of getting started with. So thank you for a very cool. thorough presentation and breaking that down. Um, just as a, as a note to everybody, our Q&A, um, we are going to run over the hour. Uh, we are always happy to stick around after. Sean has always hung around for our after hours anyways, so I'm sure he won't have any problem taking questions beyond the hour. Um, so please do keep asking your questions. And if we don't get to them, we do have the Wild Labs forums. Um, we have a Tech Tutors thread for this specific episode where you can also ask your questions um, just in case we don't get to all of them. Um, I'll go ahead and kick us off with a question, which is kind of along the lines of what I just said. Uh, this topic has come up over and over throughout the Tech Tutors series. People asking, what is Laura? Who is Laura? Um, what does this mean? What are all of these terms? It's very mysterious to us. It does feel a little bit like magic, like you said in your presentation. Um, so I guess my question would be, why do you think this is so complex and difficult for beginners to get started with? Um, and how can communities like Wild Labs make connectivity topics in general more accessible to us beginners? Wow. Um, I think... I think to a certain extent, quite a lot of this is because it's and I'm not please, I'm not being condescending when I say this. It's just outside people's sphere. You know, you 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 sometimes get into um, a topic into such great depth that when you're trying to learn something else, sometimes mm -hmm. that. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sean, if I could just interrupt, um, if you wouldn't mind stopping. Uh, um, if you wouldn't mind, oh, yeah. it just makes the recording look a little funny. <laughs> okay. Thank you. OK. It's it's maybe just outside of people's sort of sphere, and it's a it is a lot to get hold of. I mean, that seven layer model, you know, you see things like that. I mean, it to to me, it's bread and butter, you know. But looking at the reproductive system or the you know the respiratory system of of, of animals and whatever, completely completely alien, you know. I just I'm starting at first principles again, and I think you know. Um, there is maybe a bit of um, siloism when it comes to lots of this sort of stuff. And, you know, um, and I think to a certain extent, quite a lot of the manufacturers have kept it so, you know, trying to get you to buy into their infrastructure. And it's only when you're prepared to get out of your comfort zone and get into the sort of nerdy parts of the domain, places where myself, Rob and Tom and uh, are prepared to hang out and find out about this stuff you actually find out that actually it's like it's basically like making a phone call you basically the thing decides when it's going to ring it rings the number it was given the thing at the other end answers if it's not there it doesn't answer it's it's um you know it's 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 as simple as that and i think one of the things it uh, as well is 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 is, it, it is gathering momentum you know i think 
to a certain extent, research has been, especially in the area of ecology and stuff, it's always been about, you know, we'll go out and we'll do a six month study or a two year study or whatever. And that's been the accepted practice. And I think now you can actually get real time data from lots of other net technologies, not just LoRa, lots of technologies. Maybe people's mindsets are changing to, OK, well, let's try this instead and then trying to bring those other technologies into play. Does that help? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, and in the same uh, vein of questions from beginners, Carly um, has, of course, been the inspiration partially for this episode for asking yes. us many times, what is Laura? Who is Laura? What do all of these terms mean? So I'm going to hand it over to her um, to give us a few glossary questions, because I'm sure <laughs> other people in the chat have also had these questions. Uh oh, Carly, I think you might be frozen. There you go. You're oh. You're you're moving now. Okay. You're fine. You're muted though. You're muted. I'm I'm really a mess, really. <laughs> um so <laughs> yeah, with that's a yeah, with this and many other things. Um so let me understand if I'm getting this correctly. The so Laura versus Laura Wong. What is that difference? Right. Laura is the communication technology that exists over Laura Wan. So Laura Wan is a wide area network that is set up to use LoRa as its communication protocol. So okay. uh, uh, WAN is a wide area network. So that's an interconnected network of devices to cover a long area. So uh, on that slide, we had things like bands and cans and they're sort of like a little tiny network. So a, a LAN is a local area network. So that's what would exist in a building or whatever. Once we get to WANs, we're looking at continents. So we're looking at poss possibly multiple paths or multiple steps or hops or jumps to use the sorry jumps or hops to use the correct technology that a, p a piece a data packet would have to travel through in order to get from source to destination lora is the wi-fi technology it you that the node uses to transmit its sensor data to the first hop in that gateway which is the sorry the first hop in that network which is the gateway so LoRa is the technology that does the wireless transmission and LoRa WAN is all of the back end and infrastructure to get it from a radio signal through to a piece of data that you can look at on a web page. OK, thank you. That was great. I think so LoRa is like a, a protocol you you guys like yeah. call it and a bunch of yeah. other things are called protocols. Does that like for as an ecology analogy for us like dumb conservation people um, is the like, is it like the the protocol for naming a species, right? Like genus, like species, genus, order, like that kind of, is that kind of like something analogous to like how the these communication protocols where they're like, they use specific frequencies or like. Yeah, know. there are lots of different. I mean, within that, but within that bandwidth, within that range, with the, the within the, w w there are lots of different protocols that exist within that license fee range, using lots of different chipsets to make that connectivity. Like for instance, quite a lot of the uh, remote control key fobs you get for garages and stuff are in the four three three megahertz range as well, but they use a different technology in order to communicate so but they're still within the same frequency range but if you imagine um if i've got two plastic cups and i'm setting up that old thing where you've got a piece of string and two plastic cups to communicate between one another okay if i use a bit of wool okay wool that's low ra if i'm using a piece of string that's wi-fi if i'm using a bit of um fishing line 
that's um, GSM. So it's the same doing the same job, but I'm using a different technology to do the connection. So the two plastic cups are still there, but I'm just using a different medium to transmit. So GSM would be a piece of fishing wire. LoRa, like I said, would be a bit of uh, string or whatever. Wi-Fi would be a bit of wool. It's still doing the same job, but it's just a different thing. Same thing, just a different name. GSM is different frequency range, different types of communication protocol that's actually keeping it, keeping the signal going, maintaining the connection between the base station and the ha and the handset, all those sorts of things. So it's it's almost like um. It's almost like um, like an instruction set for making a, a meal. You have to follow the instructions in order to get from the bare ingredients to the end point. And each one is different for each one. So you need to set up X, Y, and Z in order for GSM to work, or you need a wireless frequency uh, adapter for a Wi-Fi, as well as you need a different wireless base stations. So you can't use the same protocol to compute, to connect to different devices. Does that help? Yes, that was a brilliant analogy. Thank you very much. I okay. I need this. And by the way, I looked everywhere for a picture of a lemur called Laura, and I couldn't find one anywhere. I was desperately trying to get one in my slides, saying this is Laura, uh, but I couldn't find one. I I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate the effort. We'll we'll find one in the after hours. That'll be task number one. We'll find a lemur that we can name, name. Laura. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Sean. Um, we have a bunch of questions from Eventbrite. Uh, so I am going to get to a couple of these so these people can watch in the recording later. So this is one that I think kind of ties into what we've just been talking about. Um, this is from Ewan Parsons, who asks, what are realistic expectations? I think this is a, another really good beginner question because like you said, this kind of feels like magic to those of us who don't understand this. So what are what are things that people should expect to be able to do with this versus things that maybe are a little too blue sky for people who are getting started? Okay, that's a really cool question. Um, and in, in all honesty, and I'm gonna be boring now and talk about my, my research project as well, you know, a lot of this, um, a lot of what is promised by all, everything, you know, everybody promises big. I mean, I told my wife that I knew everything and she keeps wanting me to divorce me every year because I obviously don't know everything. Um, but the problem is, is that the lots of these products all do oversell. You know, you'll see online that they say that LoRa is, is, is capable of up to 16 kilometers. And in my slide, you'll saw that the spreading factor from the main provider themselves, they say is 12 kilometers. So, you know, you know, lots of these things in, in an ideal situation. So basically in a flat, uh, in a single flat plane with nothing in the way, you could probably get 16 kilometers plus, you know, um, the land record, like I said, is something like 700 kilometers, but it was one way. And basically the guy was the guy was stood at the top of a mountain and the person who was receiving was driving down a motorway, which literally went in a straight line from the top of that mountain. And there was nothing else in the way, drove across two or three countries and was sat there with his receiver that far away. You know, so, you know, we are looking at ideal, ideal um, uh, conditions in order for you to be able to get realistic. I, I personally, you know, I'm looking at five or six kilometers for my for my research. Um, but like I said, once you start to think about this, you actually need to potentially um, think about your um, your data collection. And is that OK? If you know that your species is migratory and they move around between two places, can I get it so it's not setting sending all the time? Do I just make sure that when it's within a particular geographical location and it's nearby, it then sends the data there because I know that's nearer rather than trying to wait, uh, you know, trying to, you know, um, not get packets being sent from 14 kilometers away. Sorry, I'm going to turn the lights on because I, two seconds. 
There you go. <laughs> I'm not bright orange now. There you go. Um, so basically, you are you're you actually trying to make it so that your sensor node is actually sending it at an optimum time. So you know those are other things that you need to think about when you're actually designing your package, your microcontroller. You know, beaming stuff out every two minutes is no use if you're nowhere near a base station, and that's something you really need to think about. So um, realistically without being blue sky you know you need to you need to set your limitations you need to have a an understanding of what it is you want to transmit how often you want to transmit because the spreading factors will limit that and to a certain extent that's taken out of the hands of you you can force it to use a spreading factor but the trouble is is if it's a doing it at that set bit rate you could lose quite a lot of packets you could actually be in a situation where you're where your 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 data stream is is not valid because you're not getting enough throughput in order to do what you need to do. OK, that help? all right. Yeah, wonderful. OK, so we're going to go about um, 15 minutes longer with the Q&A's. Um, Sean, are you are you happy to yeah, keep yeah. going no, for sorry. that time? That's okay. my, my fault for waffling too long in my slides. <laughs> it's all right. This is a complicated topic and you're answering these very thoroughly, which I think is is very helpful. Um, again, as I said, if we don't get to your question, please do ask them over in the Wild Labs forums and Sean will get back to you uh, through that. Our next question is from Peter Apps, Ops, uh, who has a question about using this technology to study predators. Uh, Peter, it looks like you do have a mic if you wanna jump in. Yes, thanks, interesting so far. My specific application is African wild dogs and um, a couple of years ago I looked at LoRa as a potential substitute for ground to ground radio tracking. And what struck me at the time was there were lots of people doing elephants and rhinos and nothing smaller than that. And I'm just wondering in the, the previous, in the last two years, has anybody actually done LoRa tracking with uh, transmission of GPS fixes from a 25 kilogram animal? Um, they have uh, smart parks. Uh, I've actually looking at a picture of it here. Um, they've actually been tracking leopards. OK. Um, they've been very quiet. A, yeah, um, I don't know what they're trying to do. Um, this, this would probably be a bit blurry, but uh, if you just bear with me two seconds. Can you okay. see that? Uh, I just see your SS button. I definitely think that's a cheetah. Oh, oh. <laughs> not this end is not. OK, so on cheetahs. Well, that's yeah. a similar Sorry. way to end. Cheapers, yeah. Okay. Like I said, I'm a cable so monkey. I done. know nothing about animals. <laughs> so, so it is being done. I just need to. Yeah. Get my Googling up to and, speed. And, and the, um, the, the point I was trying to make in the slides is quite a lot of this technology now because they're trying to get it out to the um, to the to the general public. Quite a lot. Of this is now actually used in the commercial markets. They've got them for um, cattle. Um, they've got yeah. them for um, other um, sheep and stuff like that. I know that they've been tested in a farm just not too far from here for what sheep that are out on the hills so they know Leo bro uh, so they can go out onto the hills and uh, know which hill to drive up on on their quad bike so they don't end up spending half a day wandering around the wrong side of a mountain um so yeah they're that's, being quite yeah that's exactly what i need to do with the wild dogs yeah ping for a current gps location so that yeah. somebody can go there and see what they're up to and upload gps on onboard stored gps fixes yeah. and such rather i mean that's rather the, than um, the, the bison collar is doing there. exactly that sorry peter okay so things have things have progressed a bit since i last looked is the, is the yeah. take home it's a gps um, enabled collar for the bison as well so this is a gps collar so um obviously bison's a lot bigger but the the technology definitely exists um for using GPS collars, transmitters. So um, 
one of the things, of course, as well is, is you need to basically GPS uses a lot of data, uh, sorry, a lot of power. Um, so you're looking yeah. at something, um, you're looking at trying to keep the, um, the GPS uh, tracker um, as low power as possible and trying to make sure that I've I've been using I've been using the really large GPS um, antenna. You can get them cut down for really low weight, um, really tiny things that you know like this. But I found that it just spent loads and loads and loads of battery power trying to get a fix. So if I used a really spent my cash and bought a really big antenna, I got a much quicker lock. And then as soon as I got a lock, I could switch it off as quickly as possible. So I didn't need to worry about that. So that might be something you maybe need to look at when you're asking about the collars, what sort of, you know, locate, you know, what sort of battery life, what bang for buck are you going to get for that? Yeah, we've been using GPS extensively over the past few years. It's just really the, the lower would cut the VHF ground tracking yeah. out of the loop. So people yeah. could sit in camp instead of burning diesel. Yeah. Peter, I think that this would this would be a really great topic to put over in the in the forums. It seems like there's a lot of discussion that could keep going with this. Um, people yeah. might be working on similar things and want to give their opinions. So if you would like to, please yeah. drop this in the forums because I think we would like to see this continue. Okay, for sure. All right, um, I'm going to move to a question from a Keith that seems very important about cost. Keith, are you still here? May not be, in which case I will go ahead and uh, read this out um, since we're short on time. So Keith says, how cost feasible is this for PA managers, no, protected area managers? All oh, right, okay. Um, it all depends um, on uh, what your deployment is. I mean, if you are if you're looking at protected areas, I would I would strongly suggest that the vast amount of your cost is going to be backhaul budget. Uh, and sorry to talk, but those of you, backhaul is how you get your data from your gateway back to somewhere that you can use it. So, you know, if you are looking after a massive protected area, you're going to need to have some way of actually interconnecting these base stations. You know, yes, we can run them off solar power. That's fine. But at some point you need to have a link in the chain uh, that's going to get you back to some sort of Internet connectivity. So, yes, we can get, um, you know, these are these these um, Lorix ones are really cost effective. You know, they are bit of shrink wrap they're fairly uh you know weather robust we can use power over ethernet one cable we can make sure that they're, they're pretty bomb proof however that's it that's as far as it goes you know the data goes as far as here and now i've got to do something with that data there's i've got to find some way of connecting this and getting this out to the to the rest of the world so that I think would be your pro so the actual interconnectivity within your area with low RAR, it's all depends on what area you're looking for, but you've got um you've got problems with backhaul, getting your data back to somewhere where you can use it. But Sean, is there like like price range general price range are we talking thousands hundreds dozens like um price range uh this this is by i think it's 500 quid this is um some of the the uh you can build them with a raspberry pi and a hat which will cost you 100 quid for your gateway uh, the nodes, I bought 10 of those little Heltec ones, which was the first one I showed you on the screen. I bought 10 of those. And I think it cost me 18 quid and they're all low raw nodes. They just do. I just have to buy the sensors to go with them. So, you know, my um, my temperature sensor or whatever, that's extra cost. So you, you can get the nodes down. It depends on what what you're trying to do. But I mean, like I said, 18 quid for 10 nodes and then couple of quid for temperature sensors or the like. 
but it's 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 the gateways and the back end that's the problem. Getting the data to the back end, I think, would be the problem. Especially All right, for you. Rob, I see you've been waiting very politely with your hand up. Um, it looks like you have a comment, so go ahead. Um, it was just, I just wanted to, because when Peter asked before about the situation with different trackers, I've been kind of looking at this. I think lots of us have probably been looking at similar things. Um, so I started off, Peter, with this device here, which I think um, Sean showed in one of his slides a, a company called Dragino or Dragino. So yeah. they make this little not so little, um, GPS LoRa tracker, which is about, I think I paid 70 Australian dollars for that. And it's principally designed for tracking um, old people, so people like me. Um, but I wanted to see whether it would be feasible to, you know, get that kind of device into something about the size of wild dogs like dingoes or maybe even koalas but i came across this other mob called neuro Myco, and they make that device which is the smallest one we've seen so far um it's basically the same thing in a much much smaller chipset um it's a quite a bit more expensive. I think they're about 300 US dollars, I think, for, for one of them. Um, but what we're sort of interested in is um, we got approached by a big group who want to kind of do this en masse. And so, I mean, this is kind of why this topic is of great interest to me, because what I, what, what I think is a problem for us tracking is that we're all basically trying to do the same thing. We're trying to find devices that will tell us things about our animals. And we all go to, you know, a subset of providers or manufacturers around the world, or we buy stuff off the shelf and we try and hack it together. This idea from wires is to effectively make a very large number of very low cost devices. So like, you know, tens of dollars rather than hundreds of dollars and create a sort of a network in places where these animals can be monitored en masse like that. And I'm kind of interested in, in whether or not that's of interest to other people, because I think one of the big limitations with Laura is always going to be, um, like Sean was saying, is it's about throughput. So, you know, for camera traffic, for example, Laura's probably not going to you know, be that useful unless it's actually doing something like summarizing the images. So I just wanted to show that. I don't want to steal Sean's amazing thunder, but I wanted to point that out because I've been sort of doing this this search as well, and there are some small devices. So if anybody's kind of interested in that, maybe um, hit me up and we can talk about it. And Rob, this is a great introduction. Um, as we get close to the end of the Q&A, we do hang around after the episodes all the time for a little chat about conservation tech. And Rob is always here until like 3 a.m. Australia time. So uh, right. feel free right. to right. feel free to hang around and see more of that. Um, we are going to- Yes, and that as well. Um, it looks like David had a, a follow-up question on costs. So David, um, one more question, and then um, we will get to the final question. Thank you everybody for hanging around a little bit afterwards. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things that I always try to think about with, with cost is also durability, right? It's no good to have a $10 sensor if you're replacing it every two months. Has the LoRa hardware been kind of like torture tested, you know, who's sending it out into really harsh climates and seeing how long it takes to, to die. Yeah, uh, there are people, uh, there are, there have been projects actually uh, trying to look at that. And I've been caning mine and uh, I've built some specialist, um, um, some specialist enclosures, which I've then resined and then uh, for a project I was working on, actually put it in 
with some wild animals to just let them kick it around and see. Uh, the, um, unfortunately, uh, one of the problems you have with the, this is it's a, it's a printed circuit board and you have all of the problems that exist with that. We've tried embedding them in resin and various other things like that, David, and the trouble is, is they tend to overheat or cause you all sorts of problems after that. Um, there are there are people out there who are making more and more robust nodes. There's a uh, there's a really cool. Uh, where's the boy? Here it is. Uh, this. Uh, how do I? And I'll share this quickly. Sorry. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, it just popped up. Yeah. So that's uh, basically a, a buoy that's out in the out in the sea for measuring wave height. Um, and obviously, you know, the sea is unrelenting. So. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that does. So basically, that's actually the it's, it's all been put inside, and then it's actually I think um, I think it's actually put inside the injection molding before it's injection molded. So it's actually um, not um, it's not a unit that's been made, if you know what I mean, because they've tried things like that. Like um, I don't know if you can see, but on the on the wall behind me. On the it's, it's very small with your uh, with your yeah. camera. They're 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 Ferrero Rocher. I don't know if you know a Ferrero yeah. Rocher. You can buy Ferrero Rocher in big, clear plastic um, things. Well, I'm allergic to chocolate, but my wife loves chocolate, so I buy her those because then I can have those. And I've used those. I've chucked one of those in the river. I put it in the River Dee in Scotland at its source and monitored it all the way down um, to the sea. Uh, just made it watertight, lobbed it in, and you know, uh, as long as the enclosure is is robust enough, I think you can get away with. I was going to say get away with murder then, but obviously, you know, you can get away with um, uh, a normal circuit board as long as you're enclosing it and supporting it in a way that will take the take the hits. I think. All right, brilliant, and uh, this brings us to our last question. Um, so we, we got a couple questions about um, using machine learning coupled with LoRaWAN and, uh, you know, the future of that. So I guess um, bouncing off of that, my question would be, what do you think the future of this technology looks like? Um, what are what are the big areas of growth? Do you think it's, you know, more protected area management or are there possibilities that we're not really considering yet for uh, expanding this? Um, I, I think as this, I think as this progresses, I mean, going back to Daniel's talk from last week and the one he did previously, you know, the the ability for you to use things like TensorFlow or PyTorch, you know, you don't need a massive machine like, like one I've got here. You don't need a massive machine with a separate GPU card anymore, as long as you, uh, as long as you uh, spend the time to create a really good model and train it and then can export it the, the, these these um, machine learning algorithms can be run on less and less now you know we we've, we've got them running on raspberry pis they now can you know they're almost they're almost uh, i i know that they i know that daniel was saying that they run on lots of different devices but if you look at those devices that are in the list they are they tend to be the beefier <laughs> beefier versions uh, you know, it's the one that at all the pies rather than the ones that we're looking at of keeping weight down and keeping the 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 things down as the the slow, slightly lower um, weight and smaller boards with less processing power, and less memory, because once you start getting to storage in within chips, that's when it starts to become expensive. And to go back to sort of David's question, you know, do I want to be deploying stuff at ten dollars a shot where I've got a you know, go out and, you know, if these are fire and forget, I really want them to be fire and forget. I don't want to have to keep going out to the field to collect them um, because I've got to keep updating the models or keep updating the firmware or the boards or whatever. So um, 
having the ability to sort of manage that and that should being able to push this down onto better and smaller and smaller devices more cost effective devices you know some of those uh boards that daniel was talking about are you know 70 80 dollars each and you know we really would like to be able to use the ones that are nine ten dollars each or less if possible all right excellent and uh i think that's a good note to end on so uh thank you everybody for joining for this episode of tech tutors um, we will see you next week hopefully for our last episode of this season which will be on drones uh, you can find the link to register for that in the chat i believe tatiana has just uh dropped it in um and, and as, as i said we do hang around after these episodes for quite a while to chat so uh, we will end the recording now, but please feel free to stick around and keep the conversation going. And if we didn't get to your question, use those forums and Sean will get back to you and answer those. Uh, thanks again, everybody. See you next week.